When my father was reaching his final days, almost seven years ago, I found myself suddenly desperately wanting to ask him so many questions. Questions about the house where we lived when we were kids and our neighbors and his neighbors when he was a kid and my mom and my grandmother. And I was just struck with the fact that not only was I losing him in the present and looking into a future without him, but I was also losing him as a touchstone to the past. It's been such a gift to me that while he was alive, he sent out periodic emails where he told long stories about his childhood and about his courtship with my mother and about his mother and about my mother's mother, whom he had known since he was three and about other relatives. Those emails now are such a gift to me to have because I still get to have the stories, even if I don't have him. And our ancestors, one way or another, either with silence or with words or with vivid memories, leave us stories of who they were, stories that in my family, in a Southern family, were passed down at the table from one generation to the next. So my grandmother would tell stories of many, many generations that she didn't live to see herself you know, who, who were dead before she was born. And my father too loved to tell those stories. And I'm aware that there's not really that kind of storyteller in my family now. There's no one who's just a keeper of the history in that kind of passionate way. I know when I did family research last year and I went and read through old records, I didn't care when people were born or the names of their children. I was looking for stories. I remember I was so excited one day when I found a copy of a note that some distant relative had written to his mother saying, Ma, I'm sorry, I'm too ashamed to come home. I done you wrong, I'm never coming home, but I love you. And I thought, what, I wanna know more about this guy. And I, with a gift of Google, I could look him up and see that he had an arrest record He'd left home in Missouri and gone out to Nevada to a mining town and he'd been arrested for getting into a fight for bringing a woman of ill repute to a dance. And I love knowing that about my relative, that story. So what I thought I'd do as we celebrate All Souls Day, this day of remembering and honoring the people who are no longer with us, is tell you a few stories about Unitarian Universalists I've had the privilege to know who are now dead. But I can tell you, not all the stuff you can get on Google, but I can tell you a little bit about stories that I have about them. So I'll start with Dr. Bill Jones. Dr. Bill Jones was a theologian and a minister, a Unitarian Universalist minister. He was a black humanist. And he wrote a fabulous book, which I commend to you, which is part of his living legacy called, Is God a White Racist? And I first met him in 1986 at a gathering of religious educators. The religious educators used to gather in Madison, Wisconsin every February, it would just be freezing and uh, learn about something. And this one was called Neo-Racism and, um, and I thought, neo-racism, what's that? So when we got there, we were divided into small groups as Unitarian Universalists love to do. And my small group actually included Dr. Jones. And in the small group, we were given the task of sharing the last time that we witnessed racism. Huh. I thought and I thought and I thought, I, I don't know people who use racist language. I don't hear racial slurs. You know, so I was racking my brain. I was thinking, well, there was that time at the gas station. I heard someone say something to someone. I guess I witnessed that. So I was sitting there racking my brain, trying to think when I might have seen racism when Dr. Jones spoke first. And he said, well, I read the paper this morning. And then he proceeded to talk about how racism was woven into analysis about jobs and houses, housing and transportation and crime and justice and all of these places. He was talking about systemic racism, something I had never thought of.
At that point, I thought racism really was something that individuals were either racist or they weren't racist, and that was that. And he's the first person, he then was using the frame of neo-racism to talk about it, but he really was talking about systemic racism. And he used to get up at General Assembly in the 80s and 90s, almost every year he would get up and give a presentation. And one of the things that I heard him say repeatedly was, diagnosis determines prescription. And then he would talk about how at a key moment when people could decide what to do about what was happening to black people in terms of incarceration and all kinds of other markers of inequality, that what they did was come up with a report that blamed the black family and the weakness of the black family, rather than looking at the systems of oppression that were impacting the black families. And he said, you know, when they have that as the diagnosis, then their prescriptions are going to address the family. Whereas if they had a different diagnosis, they'd have different prescriptions. And I always remember him. He got more and more sick as the years went on and he would get up weaker and older and weaker and older, but still every year, diagnosis determines prescription. He would tell us, hoping that we would hear. It's taken me over 30 years, but I, I think I hear him. So Dr. Bill Jones, you're still here, you're here in my heart, you're here in my memory and the memory of so many who you impacted in Unitarian Universalism. Next, I want to lift up Denny Davidoff. Denny was the moderator of the UUA from 1993 to 2001, but she had many, many volunteer positions. She spent her last years working as a fundraiser for Meadville Lombard Seminary. And she, but she was everywhere. Denny knew everything and she, she knew everyone and she used those connections as few people dare to do. And none of us ever said no to Denny. That's why she was such a great fundraiser. You just, you didn't say no to her. And uh, she, oh gosh, she also was one of the funniest people you would ever meet in your life. She was related to the comedian Henny Youngman and she had that kind of really quick, very funny wit, just delightful. So that in plenary, she was not only super sharp and smart, but also she would really keep us laughing just when we needed it most. I remember one year, we were finally gonna end a plenary and go to lunch when someone stood up at the procedures mic and launched into a long story about something complicated that we needed to address. And Denny just leaned over the podium of the moderator and said, please, I'll buy you lunch if you sit down. <laughs> and it was such a great response. And she meant it too. I think she did buy the person lunch and, and talk to them privately. And she just, she was amazing that way. I miss her. She is carried in the hearts of so many of us. So many of our fellows knew her at Meadville. And uh, yeah, she's just, Denny Davidoff, you are still here and you will be here as long as I have breath to tell your stories. And finally, I want to share a story of somebody. He used to be my boss. His name was Gene Navius. He was a religious educator, and for years he ran the religious education department. And I lift him up. Gene was um, a really annoying boss. Oh my God, he was a micromanager. Ay, 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 ay. But what a wonderful human being he was. And he was. He was gay before you could be out and gay. He was gay in the 1950s, in the late 1940s, at a time when it was very dangerous and Unitarian Universalism was not a welcoming place. And he became a sexuality educator and, and brought all of his gifts and finally, you know, was able to really come out and be his whole self. And that, that was such a gift for him and for all of us. By the time I knew him, he lived with his beloved partner, Stanley, and, and was just, uh, you know, so happy being able to be his full self. But Gene loved to write songs, and he, some of them were ridiculous, I mean, but he just loved to write songs for every occasion. So when I was in the religious education department, um, you know, frequently someone would be coming or going or having a birthday and Gene would have written them a song and he would hand out song sheets and 
we would all stand and kind of miserably sing along because a lot of them were just a little tiny bit humiliating to sing. He also wrote, though, one of my favorite songs in the hymnal, um, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. He rewrote words for that when Kim Crawford Harvey was installed at Arlington Street Church. That was really the first major pulpit that a gay or lesbian person ever got. And I'm sure that his excitement, he was a member of the church, but I'm also sure he was so excited to see how far we had come as a movement since his early days. And I, I lift up Gene, you know, in, in all of his humanity, because there's so many of those people like him who did that work, paving the way for people like me who are eternally grateful for those people who were out and, and did that really hard work in the hardest times so that later those of us who came out could have an easier time. Those are just three of the Unitarian Universalist ancestors that I'm thinking of today. There are many more. But we need to tell their stories. We need to keep them alive. We need to honor them and celebrate them along with our own family ancestors, along with cultural icons who are ancestors. Let's spend this week, this All Souls Week, also remembering that every, every song in our hymnal was written by somebody, a real human being with stories, that every reading, that Everything about our faith is human made, you know, with hopefully a little little help from the, from the big love, but, but really made by humans. And there are so many ancestors who are kept alive in our living tradition.